Hi everybody, it's your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are wrapping up Unit 8 and thus AP Biology by getting into Topic 8.7 today, that is Disruptions to Ecosystems. So what we've gone over for the past couple units, actually mostly Unit 7 since it's on Natural Selection, is that Natural Selection produces adaptations which are advantages to organisms in their particular environment. Okay. Natural selection allows species to become better adapted to their environment. That's what evolution, that's one way that evolution occurs. And that explains why species are so well adapted to their environment. It's due to natural selection. Okay, so species are really good, typically, at surviving and reproducing in their environment because they've spent billions of years getting to that level. Okay, so as we know, natural selection might start with random mutations, just random alterations to the gene pool, but the process of natural selection isn't random in that organisms are overall fit for their environment. Whatever traits they have, they are there most likely because it helps them better survive and reproduce in their environment. Okay, But what happens when the environment changes really fast or when the ecosystem or the environment is disrupted? That can cause lots of different problems for biodiversity, for ecosystems and species all over the world. Okay, so two examples of species that are greatly, greatly affected today by human-caused disruptions to ecosystems are the orangutan and the polar bear. Okay, the orangutan probably even more so than the polar bear right now on account of the fact that the conservation status of the orangutan is endangered which means it's on its way to becoming extinct. And the polar bear, which is, is vulnerable, which means it's on its way to becoming endangered. Okay? So think about it. The orangutan and the polar bear are really, really, really well adapted to their environments. Okay? A polar bear has the, has the right kind of adaptations, like really thick fur. It has some extra thick skin. It has the, a nose of a champion, and it can smell prey from miles and miles away. Its color, it matches in with the snow, so it's better camouflaged. The orangutan has the amazing intelligence and the really long arms and really good uh, hands for grabbing things. It's very well adapted to their environment, but they are suffering due to changes in their environment um, because they are well adapted for these environments, but they are drastically changing. If species are adapted to their current environment, they are at risk when the environment suddenly changes. Okay? We know from studying planet Earth and the history of planet Earth for a very long time that it changes. It changes a lot. Okay? But the way it's changing right now, it's faster than ever. Okay? We, in our last unit, we talked about mass extinctions, but we didn't really get into the fact that a sixth mass extinction is happening right now. In fact, species are going extinct faster right now than they did when the asteroid hit, uh, what would that be, the Yucatan Peninsula 65 million years ago and wiped out the dinosaurs. Species are going extinct faster now than that when that happened. Okay? And largely due to five different causes that we'll look at on the next slide, but maybe what's uh, causing the orangutan to be endangered is the sudden loss of habitat due to deforestation. And what's causing the polar bear to become vulnerable is that it's also losing its habitat and losing its ecosystem due to global climate change and it's melting old polar ice caps. Okay? So again, they are very, very well adapted to what their environment is supposed to be. But when it changes like this, then they are ultra at risk. Okay? So the five main causes of biodiversity loss and species going extinct right now due to their changing environment are... Habitat loss, invasive species, pollution, climate change, and over-exploitation. And there's an acronym that you can use to remember that. It's called HIPCO. Um, often there's two Ps in there for uh, one for pollution as well. Um, habitats are destroyed and then replaced with low-diversity monocultures. So habitat loss is probably the... Honestly, it might be the number one driver of species extinction and ecosystem change right now. As you, we just saw this picture before. This deforestation is occurring in the rainforest due to logging. Okay, so clearing out this land for maybe growing crops, for maybe building settlements for people to live in, uh, maybe to plant some, to for something else, who knows, maybe for cattle grazing, all sorts of stuff. The, the Amazon's being cut down for cattle grazing right now. Okay, but what's worse is that once this, once this environment is destroyed, 
Hey, oftentimes it's replaced and people feel good about it. Like, oh yeah, we planted new trees. Hey, but those those new trees or new crops that are being grown are a monoculture, which meaning that means that they're all the same species. They might even all be the same organism and they're just genetically identical, which is so much worse. Because as we know, low biodiversity makes a ecosystem far more at risk for further environmental changes than one that has a high diversity. Okay? A low diversity ecosystem is not going to be resistant to changes and that's what we're replacing a high biodiversity area like a rainforest. What we're replacing it with are monocultures, which are worse. Okay, So habitat loss and really urbanization are, are, is a huge driver of disruptions to ecosystems and biodiversity loss. Global climate change is an obviously a huge one. It's the number one environmental issue that there is. It's irreversibly impacted ecosystems worldwide. Okay? So climate change has led to more habitat loss, like we talked about before with the melting polar ice caps, but it also can change soil composition and change the, uh, well, yeah, change the soil in which producers grow, which can irreversibly alter an ecosystem, seeing as the producers are at the bottom of that trof trophic pyramid. Um, it can change weather patterns, and it can change average temperatures and all sorts of different factors that go into an ecosystem. All those a different abiotic factors are heavily affected by climate change. So here's our friend the polar bear again, um, jumping from ice flow to ice flow as a result of this melting ice. Okay, So global climate change is another huge disruption to the ecosystem. And again, polar bears are so well adapted to living up there. But what if it just all melts? Then they're not very well adapted anymore, and it's too fast for uh, for natural selection to take course. Okay, Habitat loss and... Uh, Climate change really leads to what we call a fragmentation of gene pools, where we take one population and separate it out into smaller uh, populations, and you're like, oh, that sounds like speciation, but not really when everything's dying. Um, so when they, when they spread out, when they are spread out and they're divided by, um, by habitat loss, okay, that lowers the genetic diversity of each of those populations. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like a bottleneck effect that's occurring. It's not kind of like a bottleneck effect. It is a bottleneck effect that's occurring. Um, and when those populations are isolated, they're often the, what the organisms that they live by, they're the members of the species that they live by, are the ones that are more closely related. So it promotes inbreeding. And once it promotes inbreeding, that greatly reduces genetic diversity. That's what's happening to the cheetah. That's what's happening to the sage grouse and the greater prairie chicken like we talked about um, in a previous lesson before. But yeah, cheetahs, most of them today in the wild, they're like cousins, and they mate with each other on account of their habitat fragmentation. It's really bad stuff. Okay? Expansion of cities, towns, farmland, which is called urbanization, reduces the area for habitats. It can lead to this fragmentation and reduce genetic diversity even further um, as a result of this splitting of the gene pools. Okay? Um, so it's following what's called, you might, this is, might be the most metal term you've ever heard in biology, but it's called the extinction vortex, where one thing happens after the next that leads to extinction. It's like a positive feedback loop. Okay, another really, really huge um, disruption to an ecosystem, and we can talk about this in uh, regards to a food web and ecosystem interactions, community interactions, are invasive species. Um, an invasive species is a species which is often introduced by humans, the number one driver of extinction today, um, that takes hold outside of its native range. These types of species can exploit a new niche with no predators or competitors and outcompete native organisms for resources. So basically they can move somewhere else, they're moved somewhere else by people and as a result they're in a brand new food web, they're in a brand new ecosystem, and they might not have any other organisms in that area that would either eat them or outcompete them. I know that sounds, I know that rhymes again, but um, these can be really, really bad for an ecosystem. So zebra mussels and kudzu vine, these are two prime examples of North American invasive species. They did not originate in North America, and they did not evolve and adapt in the same kind of environment um, that all the other species of plants and, you know, mollusks in North America have. So they were introduced to North America, and as a result, they had no predators, no competition, and they're able to grow like crazy. Very, very limited, well, yeah, very few limiting factors. 
Okay, that's another thing that we talked about earlier this unit was limiting factors. And these guys really don't have that many, so they can go grow cr like crazy as a result. Look at this kudzu vine over here. This was, uh, th this was a once functioning forest, but now this vine has grown over almost everything there. Okay, same with these zebra mussels. These are drastically changing the composition of fresh water, like wetlands and lakes and rivers throughout North America. And they're causing problems. They're drastically changing the ecosystem from the bottom up. Okay, so take a look at, uh, take a look at our wetland food, food web again. If you've been watching the other videos, this is like the fourth time you've seen this food web. Um, and what we looked at last time was like, okay, if we take out a keystone species, what could happen? Um, if we take out producers, what could happen? But what if we add in one more producer that outcompetes the other producers? Okay, so a, a very a very common grass that you're going to see once again in North America. It's called Phragmites, um, and it was brought over from Eurasia, I believe. Um, and Phragmites will grow like crazy, and it will outcompete these other native plants. And those native plants might be supplying the rest of the ecosystem with uh, with energy and maybe they can't have this Phragmites grass the the consumers can't have the Phragmites and it will just be a nightmare for that whole ecosystem wetlands are super in danger um, so availability of resources can result in uncontrolled population growth and ecological changes so with these Phragmites grass with the kudzu vine and the zebra mussels where that's what we're seeing is uncontrolled population growth um, and drastic ecological changes as a result of their introduction to a new habitat that they are not, well, that they haven't evolved in, okay? All right, a couple more things. that I know I've said this a bunch of times already, but ecosystem with, ecosystems with higher diversity can better resist disruptions than low diversity ecosystems, and that goes for both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. Um, so no matter what, what kind of ecosystem that you have, the more diversity it has, the better it's going to be able to resist environmental changes, even ones that we inflict ourselves. Um, so last thing I want to put it here for two other human-caused um, biodiversity loss drivers. That's a really bad way to phrase it. But industrial overfishing is a f form of over-exploitation, removing a ton of of individuals from one population if we just kind of remove and over exploit that population like say we want all these sardines or whatever these are um, that can result in a drastic change in the food web okay and plastic pollution everybody knows about plastic pollution save the turtles get the straws out of their noses all that kind of stuff uh, but this is also going to be a very major ecosystem disruption okay, for uh, for a variety of reasons it can change the composition of the water and that can result in microorganisms at the bottom of the food chain again um, so yeah either way if you have better biodiversity you're going to be better resistant to those changes um, as far as non-human cause changes uh, geological and meteorological events can affect habitat change and ecosystem dis distribution um, so two examples of geological and meteoro meteorological events that can affect habitat change um, one is El Nino and this is a weather pattern that occurs every two to seven years I believe um, and what this results in is basically changes in climate uh, in regional climate around the world um, so some areas that are normally dry might get tons and tons of rain we might get tropical storms that unlike uh, we would see in a normal year and that might disrupt um, certain in certain uh, kelp forest ecosystems on the western coast of the United States. That's one example of what's something that can get uh, harmed by El Nino. Um, but this is a weather pattern that changes every couple years and that can cause some disruptions to ecosystems. Um, and one that happens much slower is continental drift. So we have a gif over here of how, you know, due to plate tectonic activity, um, the continents have drifted. They were Pangaea once and then they broke up into seven different continents. Um, and those geological changes definitely affected habitat change and ecosystem distribution over the last, I don't know, 250 million years. So again, much slower, but nonetheless, it has changed ecosystems. Um, you know, what something that was probably on the southern hemisphere might be somewhere completely different now. That's why you can find fossils of tropical plants in Antarctica, for example. Okay? 
And by studying biogeographical studies, or by studying biogeography, we can indicate that, like, oh, yeah, you know, these ecosystems have changed. We, like I just said, we can find tropical plant fossils in Antarctica. Definitely an ecosystem change, right? Okay, so that is it for 8.7. And if you've been watching uh, my AP Biology videos all year, or maybe you're just this is the first one you're watching, I'm not really sure. But either way, thank you for watching. Uh, that will be wrapping up our video series on AP Biology, our essential knowledge according to the course and exam description. Um, so if you're taking the AP test soon, best of luck. I hope these have helped. And uh, yeah, as always, let me know if you have any questions. See ya.